Conversation 21. Jim has a cold. How are you feeling, Jim? Any better? <coughs> no. I'm afraid the cold's getting worse, Maggie. I think you'd better ring Aunt Emily and tell her we won't be able to make it tomorrow. It's interesting how you always manage to be ill when it comes to visiting relatives. That's really quite unfair, Maggie. I haven't had a cold for ages. I remember quite well. The last time you had one was when we were invited to Uncle Gilbert's. I really am feeling rotten. Have you bought me any lemons? No, I couldn't get any. But I brought you some grapes instead. Here you are. Try some. Hmm. The ones you bought last week were much sweeter. They were purple. You know I like those better. Well, I'll buy you some purple ones this afternoon. In the meantime, you'll have to make do with those green ones. Or perhaps you'd like an orange instead. I ate the last one while you were out. You don't seem to have lost your appetite, Jim. Oh, but look here. You haven't had any of your medicine today. You'd better take some right away. I had a spoonful this morning, and it doesn't seem to have done me any good. Well, you'd better have another one now. It says one spoonful every three hours. Here you are. Ugh. Oh, dear. You've spilt it all over the pillowcase. Now I'll have to get you another one. And I don't think the clean ones have come back from the laundry yet. What a trial you are, Jim. Well, just stop fussing, Maggie. I'd be quite all right if I just had some peace. You go into the kitchen and get me some lunch. All right. Maggie? What is it? Did you bring any new books from the library? Just some detective stories for myself. Here they are. Oh, I've read that one and that one as well. You'd better just give me the newspaper. Well, I'll be getting back to the kitchen then. Maggie? Maggie? What is it this time? Can you get me some more pillows from the bedroom? This one isn't really high enough. Well, go and answer it and see who it is. Who is it, Maggie? If it's Dixon, ask him to come round for a game of chess. No, it wasn't Dixon. It was Aunt Emily. She's just bought a television set, and she wanted me to tell you they were televising the cup final tomorrow afternoon. Of course, I said you had a bad cold, and that you should really stay in bed. What? Ring her up again right away, and tell her I'm much better. In fact, I think I'll get up for lunch. I'm sure I'll be quite all right by tomorrow. Have you brought me any lemons? No, I couldn't get any. But I bought you some grapes instead. The ones you bought last week were much sweeter. I'll buy you some purple ones this afternoon. You haven't had any of your medicine today. You'd better take some right away. Did you bring any books from the library? Conversation 22. Lunch for two. It's nearly two o'clock, and we haven't eaten anything since breakfast. Let's go and have lunch somewhere before we do any more shopping. There's no need for us to starve. That's exactly how I feel. There's a small Italian place on the other side of the road. Shall we try that? Yes, let's. Mmm, it smells good in here. It'll be lovely to sit down after our marathon this morning. There's a table for two in the corner. Sit down, Jane, and I'll take your coat. Have a look at the menu and tell me whether there's anything worth ordering. There seem to be six different sauces to have with the spaghetti, but they're all in Italian and I don't recognize any of them. Oh, here you are. 
There's a translation as well. You can have spaghetti with mushrooms and chicken, with minced beef, or with lobster sauce. Mmm, I'm going to try that. Lobster sauce? That sounds horrible. It's a constant surprise to me what strange things people eat. You'll stick to fish and chips, I suppose, and apple pie and custard. No. Roast beef and Yorkshire pudding with Brussels sprouts and baked potatoes. It's incredible to think that after all the effort I've made, you're still so conservative about your food. There'll be plenty of opportunity for you to poison me after we're married. Oh, Robert, it's a pity your sense of humour is so juvenile. I'm sorry, darling. Ah, here's the waitress at last. Thank goodness. Can I take your order, sir? Yes, rather. We'll have one spaghetti with lobster sauce and one roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. The roast beef is off, sir. Well, it'll have to be fish then. There'll be chips with the fish, I suppose, and not spaghetti. Oh, certainly, sir, if you wish. I hope you've got enough money to pay for the lunch, Robert. All I've got left is sixpence. Oh, it'll be all right. There should be another pound note in my wallet. Here we are. Oh, there isn't. We must have spent it. There's only six shillings left. That's just too bad. Now we can only afford spaghetti and chips at half a crown. Waitress, I'm afraid we have to change our order. Spaghetti and chips twice, please. Very well, sir. Isn't that just typical? We start off by ordering lobster and end up with spaghetti and chips. There's no need for us to starve, Robert. There's a small Italian place on the other side of the road. It'll be lovely to sit down. There's a table for two in the corner. It's a constant surprise to me what strange things people eat. It's incredible to think that you're still so conservative about your food. There should be another pound note in my wallet. Conversation 23. The rehearsal. Oh! No, no, no. Start again from where are you taking me, John? And try to build up the tension. Remember? This is supposed to thrill the audience. Right-o. I'm trying to do my best, Jane, but I just can't seem to feel myself into the part. Well, let's see how it goes this time. Where are you taking me, John? It's so strange here. There are no lights, no houses, no people. I'm afraid, John. Why are you afraid? You're quite safe with me. Don't you trust me? Of course I do. But you are acting very strangely tonight. Why are you looking at me in that queer way? Those are just foolish fancies. There are some stones in my shoe, John. They are hurting me. I must stop to take them out. Wait a moment. Hurry up. I can't afford to lose any time now. Hurry! This way. John, what are you doing with that gun? Oh! Well, you got a better pace this time, and the scream sounded very much more natural. But you still say your lines in a very artificial way, Brenda. This isn't Victorian melodrama, you know. There's no need to exaggerate and say, Where are you taking me, John? Try and talk quite naturally. Where are you taking me, John? There are no lights. No houses, no people. Once more, please, if you don't mind, from where are you taking me? Where are you taking me, John? It's so strange here. There are no lights, no houses, no people. I'm afraid, John. Why are you afraid? You're quite safe with me. 
Don't you trust me? Of course I do. But you're acting very strangely tonight. Why are you looking at me in that queer way? No, no, Brenda. You're doing the same thing again. Not, why are you looking at me in that queer way, but why are you looking at me in that queer way? You'd never say, why are you looking at me in ordinary, everyday speech, would you? Don't accent the R. I wish you'd let us finish the scene without interrupting. All right. From the beginning again, for the last time. Where are you taking me, John? It's so strange here. There are no lights, no houses, no people. I'm afraid, John. Why are you afraid? You're quite safe with me. Don't you trust me? Of course I do. But you're acting very strangely tonight. Why are you looking at me in that queer way? Those are just foolish fancies. There are some stones in my shoe, John. They're hurting me. I must stop to take them out. Wait a moment. Hurry up. I can't afford to lose any time now. Hurry. This way. John, what are you doing with that gun? Oh! That was much better. Time for tea. And there are some pastries too, if I'm not mistaken. Good show. We deserve them. Where are you taking me, John? There are no lights, no houses, no people. Why are you afraid? You're acting very strangely. Why are you looking at me in that queer way? Those are just foolish fancies. There's no need to exaggerate. What are you doing with that gun? Conversation 24. The luncheon party. Good morning, Mrs. Brown. Morning, Brown. I hope I haven't delayed lunch. I've been walking to get up a good appetite. I'm so glad you've been able to come here at last. We've been looking forward to seeing you in our new house. Tell me, how long have you been living here now? Just over a year. Well, it's obviously been keeping you busy. You did most of the decorating yourselves, didn't you? We certainly did. But why are we standing out in the hall? Let's go into the sitting room. It'll be warmer in there. Oh, it's rather chilly in here, Maggie. Well. I'm afraid I haven't lit the fire. You see, I've been trying to light it all the morning, but the wind must have been in the wrong direction. The coal simply wouldn't burn. Never mind. We'll soon get warm with some of your delicious food inside us. Shall I help you dish up, Maggie? Well, I'm afraid lunch isn't quite ready yet. You see, the meat hasn't cooked properly. It's been stewing for two hours. But it's still not quite tender. Perhaps another ten minutes. Of course, of course. We're in no hurry. We'll have a drop of sherry while we're waiting. Hello. It doesn't seem to be here. Maggie, what have you done with the sherry I keep in the sideboard? I've been using it for cooking. It's all gone. Oh, dear. But that happened to be a very good sherry. I've been keeping it for a special occasion. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Jim. I thought it was cooking sherry. Please don't worry, my dear chap. I can very well do without. Well, I'm sorry I can't offer you a drink. <laughs> Maggie, there's rather a funny smell coming from the kitchen. Good heavens! While I've been chatting with you, the meat must have burnt. Oh, dear me. Well, what was it, Maggie? Come and tell us. We won't eat you, even if the meat's spoilt. It's burnt to a cinder. I really don't know what's got into me. I've been planning all this week how to make this lunch a success, and now look what's happened. Please don't upset yourself on my account, Mrs. Brown. I'm quite sure you've got some eggs or something 
in the kitchen, which will do just as well for our lunch. Well, I suppose I might make an omelette. I've a much better idea. I'll come into the kitchen and make the omelette. I love cooking. You'll be doing me a favour if you let me try. And we'll trust you to break the eggs, Maggie. Jim. We're so glad you've been able to come. We've been looking forward to seeing you in our new house. How long have you been living here? We've had the place for just over a year. We've had to do all the painting and decorating ourselves. Conversation 25. Shopping. I'm worried about what to wear on our holiday, Jane. Jim told me I should buy myself some nylon blouses. Do you think that's a good idea? He himself always complains that nylon makes him hot. Well, look here. We're right outside Wallington's now, and you've got half an hour before Jim picks you up for lunch. Why don't we go and see what they've got? Oh, Jane, isn't that a heavenly dress in the window? How do you think it would look on me? It's your colour, Maggie. Let's go and see whether they've got one in your size. Here you are. There's another one on the rail. But it's an 18. I don't think it'll fit me. That one in the window looks smaller. Can I help you, madam? That blue dress in the window. What size is it? It's a 16, madam. Could you get it out of the window for me? I'd like to try it on. Very good, madam. Look, Jane, do you think this sweater will go with my skirt? I'm just wondering whether the brown isn't a bit dull. I think I'll have a look at that other one. No, not that one. The green one in the top right-hand corner. Yes, that's it. What do you think, Jane? I don't know that green really suits you. You shouldn't worry about whether the colour goes with your skirt. Whether it goes with your face is what matters. Here's the dress, madam. The fitting rooms are this way. Um, before I try it on, I wonder how much it costs. Twelve guineas. Of course, it's wonderful value at that price. Well. I don't think I'll take it just now. I'll have to think it over. I'm sorry for giving you all that trouble. That's 12 guineas saved anyway. Jim will be here in a moment. We can't just leave without buying anything. Oh, look, Maggie, those lovely Cossack hats. That's just what we need if we're going to Moscow. Don't be silly, Jane. We won't want hats in the summer. Still... They're very nice. You know that white one certainly suits you. And you look wonderful in that black one. I wonder how much they are. Forty-five shillings, it says here. Let's buy one each, shall we? right -o, let's. Excuse me, we'll just have these hats. Here's the money. Don't bother to wrap them up. We'll put them on right away. Won't Jim get a surprise? Oh, there he is, waiting for us by the door. Hello, Jim. Hello, Maggie. Did you buy a nylon blouse? Nylon blouse? Why, no. But tell me, how do you like my new hat? Maggie, you said you were going to buy something useful to wear on holiday, and instead you end up with this ridiculous hat. I can't think what gets into women when they go shopping. But I've saved you nearly ten pounds. How do you make that out? I might have bought a dress that cost 12 guineas, but instead I made do with a hat at 45 shillings. You should be pleased. Women. I'm worried about what to wear. Jim told me I should buy myself a nylon blouse. Can I help you, madam? That blue dress in the window. 
What size is it? It's 16, madam. Would you get it out of the window for me? I'd like to try it on. Conversation 26. Money worries. I've got some bad news, Jim. I've been given a month's notice. What? But you've always got on so well with Mr. Smithers. What's happened? Oh, it's nothing personal. It's just that the firm is moving to Birmingham. Anyone who wants to can go along, of course. But Maggie, you've been there such a long time. What will you do? Yes. Do you know, by the end of the month, I'll have been working there for six years. It does seem a long time. And I'll have been teaching at Grayson Street Modern for seven years. Perhaps it's time we both had a change. It's not good to get into a rut. What worries me is how we're going to go on paying off the mortgage on the house if I don't get another job right away. And then there's the loan from your father and the money we owe to the bank. We'll have finished paying off the bank quite soon and father won't mind if he has to wait a bit longer. But even if I do get another job quickly, it probably won't be so well paid. Quite likely we shan't even have saved enough to go on holiday by July. Well, maybe our pay increase will have come through by then. The union is quite hopeful about it. The trouble is we are simply living above our income, Jim. Only millionaires can afford to buy all those books. Well, I like that. What about those hats you're always coming home with? I'm not at all extravagant about clothes, Jim. I bought this dress I'm wearing now on my 21st birthday. Do you realize that in exactly 10 days from now, I'll have been wearing it for no less than five whole years? All right, Maggie. I hadn't forgotten your birthday. But don't let's get away from the point. What are you going to do about getting another job? You know, I thought of asking Jane whether they want anyone in her agency. My French is rather rusty, but I could brush it up quite easily. Good idea. It would be nice if you could work together with Jane. I did have one other idea, Jim, but I don't know how you'll feel about it. What is it? I thought we might let the spare room for a while, just to tide us over the summer. We'll have finished doing it up in a week or so, and then we can advertise in the local paper. I don't like the idea of having a stranger to live with us. Well, it need only be till the end of the year. By that time, we'll have settled our debts, and everything will be back to normal. Oh, all right. Let's advertise and see what happens. By the end of the month, I'll have been working there for six years. And I'll have been teaching at Grayson Street Modern for seven. We'll have finished paying the bank off quite soon. We won't have saved enough to go on a holiday by July. Maybe our pay increase will have gone through by then. Conversation 27. Maggie has an interview. Come in. Come right in. Mrs. Brown, isn't it? Please take a seat. Good morning. You'll have to excuse me a moment while I finish signing these letters. In this office, it isn't done to keep your secretary waiting. There, that'll do. Now I can concentrate on you, Mrs. Brown. Tell me, how long were you in your last job with Austin and Ford? Six years. I'm only leaving because the firm is moving to Birmingham, of course. Yes, you said so in your letter. I expect you'll be sorry to leave after all that time. I will, of course. But I think a change will do me good. 
Now, you say here, Mrs. Brown, that you've always done your foreign correspondence in English, but that you understand French quite well. Would you mind glancing at this letter and telling me what it's all about? It's from the Champs-Élysées Hotel in Paris, confirming your booking of six single rooms and two double rooms with bath for a week from July the 6th, and asking whether... That'll do. I can see you understand it. You do shorthand and typing, of course. What are your speeds? A hundred and sixty. I could do French shorthand as well at one time. I don't think that will be necessary. I wonder, though, whether you ever had anything to do with accounts. Nearly all our employees have to deal with various currency problems. I haven't had any practical experience, I'm afraid, but I did very well in maths when I was at school. I expect you'd soon pick it up. Well, I think, Mrs. Brown, I'd be quite prepared to offer you a job with us. Your old firm gave you a splendid testimonial, you know. It certainly does you credit. I'd be very pleased to come and work here. When would you want me to start? Let's say a week after you finish at Austin and Ford's. That'll give you time to have a little rest. Now about conditions. Hours are from 9 to 5.30, with an hour for lunch and a fortnight's holiday. As for salary, I think we would start you at £8.10 a week. Does that suit you? I was getting nine pounds before. Would you mind my asking whether there are any prospects of an increase? Well, I think I can promise you that we'll review your salary at the end of six months, if you do well, and I'm sure you will. Just one other thing, though. I see from your letter that you used to have alternate Saturday mornings free. I'm afraid you'll have to do without those here. Oh, that's a pity. But on the other hand, we allow our employees and their families a considerable reduction if they want to book a holiday through us. That certainly sounds attractive. We'll be seeing you on the 8th, then. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. How long were you in your last job? Six years. But I think a change will do me good. You do shorthand and typing, of course. What are your speeds? I wonder whether you've ever had anything to do with accounts. I did very well in maths when I was at school. I think I'd be quite prepared to offer you a job with us. Conversation 28, The Lodger. Good afternoon. I'm Mrs. Ingoldsby Orme. I've come in answer to your advertisement. Oh, um, come in, Mrs. Orme. Mrs. Ingoldsby Orme, if you don't mind. You've heard of me, of course. Well, I'm afraid... I'm the president of the Guild of Philosophical Spiritualists. I'm writing a book on philosophical spiritualism through the ages, and I must have congenial surroundings for completing it. My present rooms are full of most unpleasant thought waves. Well, uh, perhaps you'd like to come upstairs. Before I do... I hope you won't mind my asking whether yours is a happy home. Well, really. You see, I like living in a happy home. Any sign of dissension just prevents me from working. I'm very sensitive, you know. I do think you ought to see the room before we go any further, Mrs. Um, Orby Inglefield. Inglesby Orme. Very well. This is it. It's quite large, but I think you'll find it very warm when the fire's lit. The wallpaper wants changing, of course. 
and I don't know about having that carpet in here. There doesn't seem to be much cupboard room, either. Well... But I'm sure you won't mind my using this cupboard in the hall. Of course, you'll have to turn out all those sheets and towels. Oh, well, I don't know. Do you mind if I smoke? I feel my nerves need soothing. My dear sir, I've no objection to your smoking downstairs. But please refrain from doing so on this floor. Augustus and I are very sensitive to smoke. Where is Augustus, by the way? I distinctly remember putting him on the lead and taking him with me this morning. You have a dog? I suppose he could sleep in the kitchen. Certainly not. Augustus hates being parted from me. Now, um, there was something else I had to remember to ask you. Oh, yes. You won't have your radio on late. It's only by working at night that I attain perfect concentration. And then, of course, the slightest sound disturbs me. You mean you'll be working rather late? I usually stop typing by two o'clock. But sometimes, of course, I find myself going on all night. Well, Mrs. Oldsby Orm... Ingoldsby Orm, if you please. Well, Mrs. Ingoldsby Orm, I have to tell you that we always have the radio on late at night, and I insist on smoking like a chimney all over the house, upstairs and downstairs. It doesn't sound very suitable, then. I think I'd better go. Besides... It seems to me I can feel some rather unpleasant thought waves here as well. Well, goodbye. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry you didn't like the room. Maggie, see what you've let us in for? Never mind, Jim. The next one may be better. I like living in a happy home. I do think you ought to see the room first. This is it. The wallpaper wants changing. I'm sure you won't mind my using this cupboard. Do you mind if I smoke? I've no objection to your smoking downstairs. <laughs> 